sure all the reports tonight will be very, very short. Is that a hint? <laughs> well, I feel it's very important. Okay. All the water reports shall be long and drawn out. Yeah. Okay, we are now live streaming, so I'll turn it over to you, Mary, whenever you're ready. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening, Your Worship. We'll ask for the calling of the roll, please. Thank you. Mayor Eady? Present. Reeve Eamon? Present. Councillor Coolis? Present. Councillor Evans? Councillor Hines? Present. Councillor Jamison? Present. Councillor Sidney? We do have a quorum, Mayor Eady. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Is there any declaration between your interest and the general nature thereof? Okay, hearing none. First motion is that the minutes of the regular council meeting held electronically on March the 9th, 2021, be printed or be adopted as printed. That's for remover, please. Revimo, second by Councillor Jamison. Any questions on the minutes? Okay, hearing none. All in favor? Carry. That the communication from Tony E. Fleming. Cunningham Swan Lawyers concerning the Integrity Commissioner Services Annual Report 2020, dated March the 2nd, 2021, to be received. Over, please. Councillor Hines, seconded by Councillor Coolis. Any questions on this? Just a comment, Your Worship. Yes. It's just nice to know that uh, certainly that over the period of the last year um, that we have had no complaints in regard to um, the code of conduct. Um, that's uh, impressive for this day and age. So uh, commend the rest of council. Great. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Carrie. Councillor Evan, uh, Evans has uh, joined us, uh, Clerk Bomer. Okay. Yes, thank minutes. you. Let the minutes of the Committee of Adjustment meeting held March 2nd, 2021 be received. Over, please. Councillor Evans, second by Councillor Hines. Uh, I chaired that meeting. Uh, very little on it. There was one uh, zoning amendment for the uh, there was a lot uh, created, and there was lots of land on it. It was created with conditions. Uh, it passed very easily at the planning committee, or at the committee of adjustment, I should say. And so that's been finalized, and that's all there was to it. Any questions on it? Rebeam. Not a question so much as I like point number six about planting a tree on the severed and the retained lot. I think that's a a great practice and uh, if we put that in on a regular basis I you know I, I think we do we do well for our community. I think that's all due to we have such a great plan or need you can visualize. <laughs> but anyway, any other questions or comments? All in favor? Gary, thank, thank you. you. Okay, that the minutes of the Planning Advisory Committee meeting held March the 2nd, 2021, be received. Over, please. Councillor Hines, second to five. Councillor Evans, I'll turn it over to Councillor Hines for her uh, report. All right, this was our uh, Planning Advisory meeting for March. It happened on the 2nd of March, and uh, it was immediately following the Committee of Adjustment meeting. Uh, we did have several members of the public join us uh, for their related uh, business of the meeting. Uh, we did uh, review the minutes of uh, March, uh, excuse me, we did review the minutes of the previous meeting, which have already been at council, the February uh, 2nd meeting. And uh, the first thing on the agenda was we moved into a uh, public meeting to deal with the property on uh, Stewart Street. And this is uh, 
they're looking for an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment. And uh, this is um, J JP2G was there for representing Renfrew Victoria Hospital. And um, so this public meeting was for that application. Uh, the Renfrew Victoria Hospital is looking to purchase 2.2 acres of vacant land off of Stewart Street. And the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the subject lands from um, general commercial C2 to general commercial exception for holding. And the rezoning will permit an extended range of uses suitable for the hospital needs uh, for future development there and relate it to that whole hospital um, health village. Um, there were no concerns from the staff and uh, we had no public uh, comments on that. Um, they did a, a presentation in regard to uh, and answered questions in regard to um, all of the information we were uh, that was before us. So uh, that is moving on to council this evening. It is on your agenda. All right. And um, the next item was also um, a public meeting of planning and to deal with Gibbons Road. That's a Stantec uh, um, consultants were there on behalf of Nautical Lands Group. And um, it is looking at it was looking at an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment and uh, again as i said we had a public meeting on that and the planner certainly briefed us on what the background of that property is and the purpose of the um, official plan and zoning amendment is to redesignate and rezone approximately 25 acres of exist ex existing commercial property to residential in order to permit the development of a seniors independent living complex. And that would be consisting of a total, when it's totally finished, of 284 townhouse dwellings and um, a community clubhouse. Um, the planner, Eric Bays for Stantec was on hand to answer any questions and uh, certainly showed us what the project, the concept of the project and, uh, and the site plan. Uh, just to note that there was a, um, a commercial land study was conducted and uh, demonstrated that the town has sufficient commercial uh, designated land uh, needed for future growth. So the nautical lands group will be required to complete the site plan control process prior to the development. So um, hopefully that's a go, but that was our public meeting in regard to that. And once again, we had no public comments. Um, the committee then moved into our regular meeting and we dealt with the downtown seasonal encroachment guidelines, which are before you tonight. And I hope that you've had time, it's a fairly big document, but I hope that you've had time to review the details of that document in regard to um, this agenda. Uh, there are, the committee has spent a lot of time on um, going over it many times and trying to make it um, suitable for not only the needs of the town, but also of the, the downtown businesses that wish to have patios, whether they be major patios or whether it be a minor encroachment onto the sidewalk, such as um, um, somebody putting out a rack of shoes for the day or that type of thing. Um, but uh, it is important that we have some guidelines to uh, certainly protect the town when it comes to um, folks using the sidewalks and being able to pass on the sidewalks, but also to uh, take into consideration the needs of the downtown businessmen. So um, that is before you tonight and uh, we can answer questions on that at that time. Um, uh, to, we then moved uh, on to talk about, we at the end of each meeting, we always look at new applications or are verbally updated on new applications coming forward and ongoing developments. And uh, at this time, 
There are several ongoing developments and uh, some new applications coming forward. So they're just in the pre-construction stages and will be coming to a planning committee soon. Uh, we did have a open house on March the 15th. We had to do it virtually because of COVID times, of course. And um, it was a public meeting or it was a open house meeting where the planner went over um, the zoning bylaw and changes to it. There are really no major changes, but um, it was great to have all of that detail. And certainly um, you will be apprised of that very soon, but we are having a public meeting on that at our next uh, planning meeting. So there were no further uh, items that we discussed. So any questions at this time in regard to the planning minutes? Questions from council? Vivimo. Uh, two questions. Is it possible to get the presentation for 8.2 that was submitted by, uh, by the plan, by the Nautical Lands Group? <clears throat> and then also if we can get a, could get a copy of the commercial land uh, study that was conducted. I think those are valuable pieces of information for those of us that have conversations with others. Okay, I turn that over to the planner then to provide that to uh, members of council. And if I might, Your Worship, uh, March the 15th, I don't recall getting an invitation to that. Was that in the house in general or was it, or were we invited? Yes, I believe so. Okay, then I must uh, The planner's over. there. I just checked back through my calendar, didn't see it, so. Yeah, okay. Apologies. Yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> through you, Mary Edie, yes, uh, there was statutory notice issued for that. Um, I think we had most of the committee in attendance, but uh, um, I believe I'd sent out the draft bylaw along with the notices um, at the end of February, if I recall. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I uh, I probably didn't pay attention to that. Um, I'm dependent upon calendar notices now. Uh, my mistake. Yeah, that's okay. Um, we are having an open meeting at planning, uh, a public meeting at plan our next planning meeting which is in April, on April uh, 6th. So if you'd wanna tune into that, I'm sure the um, planner can review that for you. There are very few changes, but it was a very good presentation because we did go over it page by page and all the members of the planning committee were in attendance. Hey, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, the plan of weather's report dated March the 18th, 2021, concerning downtown encroachment guidelines, new policy be received. Mover, please. Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Jemison. Okay, we do have another motion coming up uh, uh, as a bylaw of the downtown seasonal encroachment. So at that time, maybe we'll ask Planner Withers to. Uh, Give us uh, his report. In the meantime, is there any questions on this? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Carry. Okay, the bylaw 17 2021 being a bylaw to establish the downtown seasonal encroachment guidelines as a new town policy be read a first time and deemed to have been read a second time. I need a mover, please. Councillor Hines, second by Councillor Jamison. I'll turn it over to uh, Planner Withers to give us uh, this report. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mayor Edie and members of council. Um, this initiative is uh, follows the, uh, the downtown reconstruction. It's been something that the committee, planning committee has been working on uh, for some time. It actually predates me. Um, and, uh, and the idea is really just to um, encourage um, users of the sidewalk. So in this, in this case, we're talking about, generally speaking, restaurant patios, to encourage users to have a quality of, um, of design and, uh, and operations that are acceptable 
given the fact that the town has put significant investment uh, into the downtown through its reconstruction. And um, so these guidelines, um, they achieve a, a number of objectives. So I, I noted the, the kind of the quality. They also speak to uh, public safety. So ensuring that, um, ensuring that patios maintain a safe uh, right of way for pedestrians that are also using the sidewalk. Um, ensuring little details like, um, like kind of the placement of umbrellas and, and uh, electrical cords and, and uh, kind of the types of materials that are used uh, are, are kind of are accounted for. So um, the, the hope through this is that we're going to be able to continue to implement our, our encroachment program. Um, hopefully it doesn't, uh, the idea is that it's not going to, to cause additional burden to, uh, to downtown uh, businesses, but that it'll provide some kind of framework that we, that we work with. And in many cases, it's implementing what we already do. So, uh, you know, we already make sure that patios are, are safe for the, for the public. We already try to make sure that they're tasteful and, and well-designed and, um, and things of that nature. But um, rather than these things just coming about uh, as we review them, it's helpful to have, uh, have the guidelines up front so that everyone's aware of the expectations as they're planning for their patio season. Of course, uh, that's coming up pretty quickly this year. Um, I heard today that uh, that Ottawa has already kicked off their patio season and in, in uh, you know coming into late March. So uh, this is something we're going to have to think about a little earlier this year. Um, we also have the uh, the patios. Um, in parking lots that we need to also consider. This isn't related to this guideline, but we're going to also have to um, uh, extend our temporary use bylaw for this year in all likelihood. Um, you know, it would have been nice if we saw the back end of COVID uh, by this point, but um, I think the reality is we're going to start, there's going to be businesses relying heavily on, on patios again this year. So we need to uh, be considering that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think the guidelines, if there are any specific questions on them, uh, we've tried to make them kind of flow as, as well as you can. Um, tried to identify, I'm just scrolling through here, through, through the guidelines, you know, page three outlines the classification, major and minor, that reflects um, council's establishment of the, uh, the two classes of encroachments and how we deal with them. Um, outlines the application process onto page four, application requirements moving to page five, and then uh, section four, um, moving down to uh, pages five, six, and seven, just um, guidelines with respect to how they should be operating. Section five deals with design, provides some, uh, some parameters related to the uh, dimensions of patios, where they should be located. Um, On to page eight, we are dealing with furniture, uh, fencing, tactile tape. On to page nine, just talking about other amenities like refuse, uh, containers, signage, lighting. Um, On to page 10, and we just keep going on there. We are trying to deal with, you know, most of the amenities that we would be dealing with. Uh, with with any kind of patio. Um, I'll note that on page 10, you will uh, you can see that there is a reference to sneeze guards. Hopefully we don't have to have those uh, anymore, but we've had, uh, we've been given advice from the health unit that it's advisable that patios have sneeze guards around the perimeter of patios to, because uh, the reality is that uh, a two meter separation distance isn't going to happen between patio users and pedestrians. Uh, just We just don't have the space for it. So I think the sneeze guards, uh, the health unit is advised that they are, they are appropriate for the foreseeable future until we get this thing behind us. Uh, and then just some, uh, some administrative details on the final pages. Um, 
I think I'll maybe leave it, leave it at that. If there are any specific questions, uh, certainly be happy to field them. And uh, otherwise, um, we're, we're recommending that this guideline, this policy, this guideline be adopted as a new town policy by bylaw. The idea there is that it'll survive um, this term of council until such time as, uh, as any council determines that it's not, it needs to be changed or, or amended. So uh, that is the recommendation. Okay. Any questions on this? Rebimo and then uh, Councillor Jemison. Thank you. I, thank you. I, I like the. I like this. To be quite honest with you, uh, and my questions are just meant for clarification. Uh, <clears throat> on the first page, it says uh, further. This document is uh, intended to ensure that all patios and street furniture add to the downtown through the use of high quality materials and design compatible with the heritage character. Is that? consistent language with our with our other planning documents oh, um, I just I'm just curious to make sure we have some consistency with with language that's all I, I agree with it um, I just want to see it carried over if possible to, to other documents yes thank you uh, Mary I can't say that it's verbatim but um, but uh, my recollection of the um, the urban design guidelines that the town had completed, there was a strong reference to uh, to heritage character. Um, my in my experience working with cultural heritage, that's a that's a common uh, that's a common phrasing, and a common kind of standard is that the um, is that any any new uh, alterations to the downtown or to a heritage area complement uh, the character of it. That doesn't mean it has to be the same. Uh, there's often a misconception that uh, that good heritage design has to be has to look old, and that's not true. Um, there's lots of good uh, modern architecture that complements uh, uh, complements the kind of the traditional architecture that you see in heritage communities. And in many cases, you actually don't want to replicate it because what it does is it actually takes away from the original design. So I. I won't get into it too much, but that's the, the idea is that just based on our assessment and review of the of the materials that it's not going to detract from the heritage character uh, of the downtown. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Councillor Jamison. I'm sorry, uh, Rebimo, did you have one more? Yeah, I, I two more if you if you will, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, on page two, it says uh, may apply flexibility in the application of the guidelines. Um, I'd like I like that phrasing, um, and I'm just wondering if there is some kind of a checklist that would be used similar to a minor variance where there's the, the four tests, um, just so there is consistency in, in how much flexibility, because um, you know, I would want us to be so flexible as we just ignore it. And so that's kind of uh, you know, the question I have. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and through you, Mary. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, strictly speaking, Section 45 of the Planning Act wouldn't apply, but I think I gather what uh, uh, what you're saying. I, I think I think what it comes down to is that the committee is is used to implementing those kinds of criteria, and um, I think where the committee feels that it's reasonable to uh, approve a variance from the guidelines, that um, you know, I think it's you know, it sh they should be able to do that. Um, I, I think the test is, you know, pre it's, it's pretty consistent. Section 45, someone didn't just, you know, uh, well, someone did, did make it up, but, you know, I think it, if it reflects what is, what is seen to be a reasonable variation from, uh, from a, you know, from a standard. So, uh, you know, that I wouldn't be surprised if that's the kind of standard that we would be implementing when we're considering any flexibility, but, but, at the end of the day, it comes down to the reality is businesses need to operate and they need, they need sometimes need some accommodations. And I think where it's safe uh, and kind of tasteful to do so, I think that those are, those are accommodations that we can, that we can make. Okay. Thank you. And just one more, your worship, if you don't mind, uh, just an observation. I really like the the lighting in 5.18. I like it's you know the specified how it's how it's laid out and it's directed down. 
um, and a suggestion, uh, the county has an accessibility committee that, that does assessments and road shows in terms of bringing people into, uh, they meet a couple times a year and they, they sort of test. And that might be something, you know, I meant, I noticed in here, it mentioned something about um, in section five, somewhere about uh, people with uh, um, accessibility and other, other concerns. So that, that might be something you want to do at some point is just to, is to run a, a test on it. Thank you. Very good document. I really like it. Councillor Jemison. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a great bylaw and it's nice to finally have something for this because it's been, you're right, it's been um, in the works for a while. Um, my question is, uh, I have a couple of questions. So on the signboards, the A-frames, so you're saying that, that they require a permit. Now, is this just for the downtown, like the main street, or is it for the back streets, the two streets like Plant and the other one on the other side as well? Thank you for the question and through you, Mary. A-frame signs are, are considered to be signs in the town sign bylaw. So they always require permits. Um, in the downtown, um, and I think we would, yeah, we would consider it to be uh, Raglan Street South and kind of any of the, any of the side streets. Um, we would also be looking for, if someone wants to put a sign on the sidewalk, we would be looking for uh, for a minor encroachment uh, acknowledgement and waiver, and that's that just that's that two pager that um, that we had before council, um, I believe about eighteen months ago. And it's it doesn't cost them anything. It's basically they're just acknowledging that it's going to stay out of the way for the most part. And it's not going to look terrible, and um, and it's. Uh, you know, it'll stay kind of in front of their business for the most part. And it's, you know, not going to, uh, not going to pose a, a danger to motorists or pedestrians. So that, that in the downtown specifically where people want to put a frame signs on the sidewalk, that's a, that's the requirement. Okay. And then, so, and then my second uh, question was in regards to the enforcement of like this bylaw when it comes to patios and entrances to making sure that there's enough room for people to pass, you know, on the sidewalk between the, whether they have it fenced in. Like we had a patio last year where there wasn't enough room for anybody going down the street who was, who had um, accessibility issues if they were using a walker, they wouldn't even be able to get through. So who's going to be enforcing that? Is that going to be bylaw? Like MLS, MLAS? Uh, thank you for the question and uh, through you, Mary. Uh, is, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think bylaw enforcement would be would ultimately be the implementation arm through that. I think before we get to that point, though, we would be trying to work with the applicant. And last, I I know exactly the situation you're referring to, Councillor Jameson. We did try to work with the applicant um, to resolve that situation. That's a that's a tough spot. Um, this year, they're hoping to construct a, uh, a boardwalk similar to what Santa Fe had to deal with that. Um, but yeah, that, that's a tough situation. I think if it, ever, if it ever came down to an adversarial situation that couldn't be resolved, we'd be looking to council for direction on, uh, on whether uh, they would like us to actually go in and physically remove the, um, the patio. I think at the end of the day, it is on town property. If it is posing a danger to public health and safety, then I think it would be something that would need to come to council's attention uh, to, to ensure that it's dealt with. Thank you. Right. Like I, I love the work doing this and I encourage patios and I'm a big believer in, in all of the outdoor activity that can keep people downtown and keep, uh, you know, the freedom of being able to uh, utilize the, the open spaces. But I just want to make sure that, you know, like people are safe and that, you know, there's nobody getting you know, the town's not getting sued because somebody hasn't uh, followed, you know, the, the, what, I don't want to say rules, but followed the requirements that, that are in this report. That's all. That's my concern. Okay. Councillor Hines. And you're on mute. Uh. Sorry about that. Um, I hear your question, uh, Councillor Jamison, and on page four, we do uh, 3.0 does um, stipulate that 
if you're looking to put a patio onto the sidewalk, you need to complete the application and work with the planner so that we know what's going on and uh, that it will fall within uh, the guidelines of this now that we have this uh, policy in place, uh, this policy and bylaw in place. So um, that's an excellent question and uh, this will hopefully help us through that and that um, they won't get to that point where they're setting up uh, um, uh, fences and such on the sidewalk where people can't pass. So that should all be worked out before it's ever approved as a patio. Okay, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Carried. I just want to uh, say, uh, Hunter Withers has put a tremendous amount of work in this. Uh, he's answered a million and a half questions, uh, you know, over the time of the planning committee and uh, this type of thing, and uh, has uh, entertained some pretty healthy discussion. And so, Hunter Withers, you've done a nice job on this, and thank you very much. Okay, the bylaw 17-2021 in a bylaw to establish the downtown seasonal encroachment guidelines as a new policy be read the third time and be passed. Over, please. Councillor Hines, second by Councillor Jamison. Again, any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. The planner's weather report dated March the 18th, 2021, concerning the official plan amendment and the zoning at law bylaw amendment for property located on Sturt Street be received. Mover, please. Councillor Hines, second by Reeve Emo. Turn it over to Planner Weathers for this report. Thank you, uh, Mayor Eady. Um, okay. So this, uh, this proposal is uh, is an official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment application. There are concurrent applications, and um, just in terms of where we're what we're talking about here on page three of the report, the property indicated with the star uh, is the one we're talking about. This is the one that's being used as a laydown area, currently by Cavanaugh for the reconstruction of Stewart Street, right beside the right beside the Rocky Mountain House. Uh, so the purpose of this application is the, the hospital is purchasing the property and as part of its uh, ongoing efforts to expand the health campus, the health village, um, it's acquiring additional lands and, and plans to eventually expand into this area in some form, whether that's medical offices or uh, other types of institutional uses. Um, the, uh, the property is currently zoned commercial. It's within the Stewart Street commercial core. It's vacant. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, got, it's got a good piece of frontage. It's, um, it's about uh, two acres in size, if I'm not mistaken, 2.2 uh, acres. And um, the, uh, it, it backs onto a Chartwell, uh, uh, the Chartwell facility that, um, uh, has some drainage that runs along the northern property boundary. So if you, again, go to that, that map on page three of the report, if you look at kind of the north northwesterly boundary, there is a, there is a ditch, a low area, if you, if you kind of drive along there, um, that uh, there's actually, uh, the town required an easement uh, back in the uh, mid-2000s. And... Um, it was never it was never registered, so that's being required um, by the applicant uh, or by the uh, by, by the own. It's it's be it's being required by the town. Chartwell is going to be applying for it, and uh, it's going to be granted by the current owner of the uh, of the subject property here on Stewart Street. So it's related. It's it's related in that this easement is required on this subject property but it's related to a previous application. So we're, that's, that's just a note that we're just, just kind of cleaning things up from a previous file. Um, I think that the situation was the previous owner wasn't willing to convey that easement. So we're, we're taking advantage of the situation uh, here. 
Um, uh, so in terms of the nature of the zoning amendment and the official plan amendment, uh, we're really just going from a commercial zone and designation. Uh, we're maintaining the commercial nature of the property uh, and we're adding institutional uses uh, to, to, it, uh, to both the official plan uh, designation, it's a, it's a special policy area, if you will, and then the, to, the, uh, to the zoning through a site-specific zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, a holding zone is being recommended for this. And what that means is that um, the property can't be developed for the purposes identified in, uh, in the holding zone until the conditions of the holding zone are satisfied. You can use a holding zone for lots of different reasons. In this case, it's for, um, for uh, environmental uh, assessment reasons. Uh, every commercial property that is that is being converted to a sensitive land use is required to, um, to address the potential for environmental uh, concerns on the property. So that's pretty standard. And then a site plan approval for any, any, uh, any institutional uses. So those are the two conditions uh, to the zoning and that's, you can, you can uh, see those conditions on uh, in Appendix A to the report. And uh, so bylaw 18, oh, we've got a bit of a situation here. Okay, the, uh, the official plan amendment is shown as 18-2021. And bylaw 19, 2021 is the zoning bylaw amendment. Um, Clerk Bulmer, there's actually supposed to be uh, an appendix, a schedule A to the official plan amendment. And I don't see it in there. Um, so that's maybe just something to, uh, to note. Um, you know, I yeah, think no, I can- um, We'll take a look for it and make sure it is inclusive. I don't see it in, in our file, but uh, okay. I, I certainly have it. Okay, very good. The, uh, the the amendment itself, I can maybe just uh, uh, maybe just just verbally describe to council the uh, the nature of it. Uh, as I mentioned, it's going from uh, from commercial to institutional. Uh, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing. There's nothing really. Uh, uh, you know, different about it other than uh, as opposed to any kind, any site specific official plan designation that you would, uh, that you would be applying to add some additional uses. So it's pretty general, the basis for it, uh, which would be included in schedule A, the basis for it is generally uh, reflected in the staff report. So I think we're fine that way. Um, in terms of the zoning, and uh, as I was mentioning, if you go to bylaw 19-2021 and you look at section, uh, section four, it identifies the nature of the holding provision and uh, provision II has uh, conditions for removal of the holding symbol, as I mentioned, site plan approval and clearance of the lands of, of environmental concern. So uh, in terms of staff's recommendation, I don't, uh, we don't have any concerns with it. Uh, we received one comment, uh, I wouldn't call it a comment. We received one request for notice of council's decision on the application from Chartwell. Um, I see no reason why this, uh, you know, this shouldn't be uh, approved. I, I, think, uh, I think it's appropriate for the lands. I think it's uh, good planning. It's, uh, and it will be a, it would be a logical expansion of the uh, the hospital's um, holdings and operations. So uh, with that all said, um, that concludes my remarks on this. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor? Very. Okay. The bylaw eighteen twenty twenty one. Being a bylaw to amend the official plan down and rent through in relation to property located on part lot four, concession one, Stewart Street, town of rent through, county of rent through, roll number 4748 0000 read the first time and deemed to have been read a second time. Mover, please. 
Councilor Hines, seconded by Revimo. Again, any further questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, the bylaw 18 2021 being a bylaw to amend the official plan of the town and rent group in relation to property located on part lot four, concession one, Sturt Street, town of rent group, county of rent through, roll number 4748 00 020 read a third time and be passed. Mover, please. We be more seconded by Councillor Evans. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Okay, the bylaw 19 2021 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 46 2010 being a bylaw to regulate the use of lands and the character, location, and use of buildings and structures within the town of Renfrew pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act, Act with respect to the property located on prior to lot 14, concession one, Sturt Street, town of Renfrew, county of Renfrew, roll number 4748-000-020-0300, we read a first time and deemed to have been read a second time. Mover, please. Councillor Hines, second by Revimo. Uh, Hunter Withers, I notice, uh, is this the same property where we just talked about? Uh, you see a part of lot 14, concession one, and the, the original bylaw is part of lot four, concession one. Slot 14. Uh, Mayor Edie, can I, you just tell me what page you're looking at? Okay, I'm looking at. Uh, I believe it should be 14, and uh, it's just uh, uh, an error in the OP uh, motions. I think it's part lot 14. Is that what, motion number 10 should have been 14? Yeah. Okay. So that can be noted then and, uh, and changed. Okay, thank yeah. you. The copies of the bylaw are correct. Yeah, the bylaws are correct. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so by number 11, did I read this? I don't think. Yes, I did. The mover and a seconder. Uh, any questions on this? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, the bylaw. 19, 2021 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 46, 2010, being a bylaw to regulate the use of lands and the character, location, use of buildings and structure within the town and rent group pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act with respect to the property located on lot 14, concession one, Sturt Street, town and rent group, county rent group, roll number 4748-000-020-0300. Be read a third time and be passed. Over, please. Councillor Evans, second by Revimo. Again, any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay. That the minutes of the Administration, Economic Development, and Tourism Committee meeting held March the 4th, 2021, be received. Over, please. Councillor Jemison seconded by Councillor Evans. Turn it over to Councillor Jemison for the report. Thank you, Mayor Edie. Um, as you can see, this was our meeting on March 4th and it was uh, a whole 26 minutes long. So um, really it's pretty straightforward and it was just a housekeeping meeting. So I really don't think I need to report anything on it, but if there are any questions, I can certainly try and answer them. Okay. Any questions or comments? Hearing none. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay. 
The clerk Bomer's and Director Hill's report dated March 18, 2021, concerning municipal communications, including digital signage to be received. And move it for that, please. Councillor Kula, second by Councillor Jemison. Uh, Kirk Bomer, yourself, or Director Hill, want to give a report? Yep, I can do that, uh, certainly. Thank you, uh, Mayor Edie, mm -hmm. members of Council. Um, so the report before you tonight um, primarily is in regards to the new digital signage and also speaks to our larger communications program here in the town. As council will recall or know that we had the new digital signage erected and put into, uh, put into service um, in January, essentially. These uh, new digital signs were paid for out of the modernization funding that we had received uh, from the province of Ontario going back, I believe in 2019. Uh, one of the aspects of the digital signage, which I'm, I'm pleased to say with the, with the assistance of Director Hill's staff and, uh, and my own staff are, is, are looking quite good. I think we've gotten better at it, if, if I could say that, as far as um, the graphics and what, to, what is more easily, uh, I guess, read uh, by motorists and pedestrians alike. So the town has, for the last uh, um, over two months, has been... Um, maintaining the content, town content. Uh, um, and uh, I think it's been quite, quite effective. Um, try to keep it current, so some modern, you know, up-to-date messaging, et cetera. But one of the other parts of it that was, uh, has been discussed uh, um, lately and been discussed at the committee level is opportunities to expand uh, upon the usage of these signs for both uh, other content, uh, other than town content, be it uh, third-party content, and that's both uh, both at at cost and no cost. So, um, looking to advance uh, an opportunity for third-party advertising sales, which would be revenue generation, um, and also have policy around. Um, requests from, say, charitable, not not for profits, or other organizations that just want to have timely messaging put up, community messaging. So, so what the uh, the uh, report contemplates is first for council to support the sale of third party advertising uh, in principle. The second is to then to direct staff to put some framework around that uh, in form of policy and uh, policy framework. And then finally, that um, based on recommendation in the report, that certainly on a temporary basis until we can get things kicked off to see where it's headed, and at the same time have have better conversations around our communications program and what to, what internal changes are may be necessary to to maintain our uh, our uh, communications program. Then that'll build back in back to committee, back to council on, on some alternatives moving forward. So I think that's kind of the general, uh, the gist of the report. Um, I can say, uh, you know, in addition to, to looking at the digital signage, the town does continue a very robust uh, communications program that has grown significantly over the past couple of years with uh, with us embracing very much uh, social media channels. So, and just to recap on that, the town does have a really solid presence on Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, I had staff just pull off a quick, uh, quick analytics for me, just, you know, and we were looking at 1600 Facebook followers, um, 1200 Instagram followers and almost 600 um, Twitter followers and um, annual posts of uh, upwards of, you know, a thousand annual posts by staff in some areas and reposts that are hitting many, many thousands. So I think um, we've seen a lot of growth again in the last couple of years on social media. And, and certainly that's another part of, I think what we'd like to look at is, you know, the, the time energy that it's taking how it's best delivered uh, the town and, you know, what the, 
build it into our digital signage as part of our whole media and communications program and how best to deliver that for the town. So um, I'm confident that staff can at least get the framework together, get a program started, and then hopefully that gives time to have some alternatives and how that might uh, might be delivered going forward in, in a longer, in the longer term. So, um, so if there's any specific questions, uh, certainly I know either myself or director Hill can answer. I know director Hill is a little more knowledgeable on, uh, on the, um, experiences by maybe other communities on third party sales, but certainly we just want to get, get moving forward with this, uh, with this initiative. Any questions or comments? Review more. Thank you. Part of the part of the conversation at committee has obviously been setting up some kind of a formula <clears throat> that recovers the cost of, of operating um, internet, electricity, stuff like that, and then also setting aside monies for eventual replacement. And then at the same time, uh, part of the formula would be recovering staff costs and use it to fund a position. Is kind of the the big picture ideals that we went into this uh, into this with. So it's it's not simply a matter of grabbing revenue and just throwing it into into the general fund. It's 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 going to be a little more strategic. Um, and it you know it was in recognition of of the amount of time that is spent communicating and messaging. And those aren't those aren't negative words. Um, you know, I think every one of us have heard a number of times, uh, you know, from people, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. It doesn't matter how many times you send, you know, you have a radio announcement, they weren't listening to the radio that day, or they don't listen to that station, uh, or they don't listen to it at nine o'clock in the morning, or how many times it's in the, in one of the local papers. Um, so you have to use multiple platforms. And this, and if you view this as another platform with this, with the same or similar message, this platform might be able to help pay for um, generation of content or management of content on the other platforms. So that's kind of the approach that was taken. Um, and as with all assets that we own, we should be looking at how to replace them and how to maintain them. So that just in general, that's kind of the recipe that was thrown to our two managers or two directors and, and uh, asked to come back with something. Okay, any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor. Okay, that the town, Redford Town Council support the sale of third party advertising on a newly installed digital signage. Further staff be directed to develop the necessary policy framework to administer the third, the, the sale of third party advertising and publish on both municipal and other content. Further that the staff resources necessary to manage the operational aspect of the digital signage program be managed temporarily by existing staff in order to provide an opportunity to review and evaluate longer term op options. Mover, please. Uh, review more second by Councillor Coolis. Any questions or comments on this? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Harry. The Treasurer Riley's report dated March 17, 2021, concerning the town's right of demand payment of the promissory note by Renfrew Hydro Incorporated and Renfrew Power Generation Incorporated in 2021 be received. Mover, please. Councillor Evans, second by Councillor Jamison. Maybe a call on Treasurer Riley to speak to this. Thank you, Mayor Eady. I think the report is. Uh, I was hoping it was uh, fairly self-explanatory. I did discuss with Clerk Bulmer um, how to get this before council because it was by way of a, an email request that uh, Renfrew Hydro contacted us. Basically what it is that the auditors for Renfrew Hydro Inc, who happened to be the same auditors for Renfrew Power Generation, um, requested through their staff that the town confirm that it doesn't have any intention of calling or demanding repayment of the promissory note during 2021. And the purpose for that is strictly financial statement presentation. By not demanding repayment of the note within the next 12 months, the debt gets classified as long-term on the books of both Rent for Power Generation and Rent for Hydro Inc. Um, if the town doesn't provide this letter saying that we have no intention to demand repayment within the next 12 months, then it gets classified as a long-term liability. 
accounting terminology, but basically the long and the short of it is, if either of the inst if either of those two corporations were to try to borrow money, and perhaps uh, Councillor Evans, with his uh, expertise in the in the mortgage area, could comment as well. But I know that uh, a couple of the ratios they look at are referred to as liquidity ratios or a current ratio, where they um, any potential lender would look at the the value of the current assets of the organization compared to the value of the current liabilities of the organization. So if your assets are greater than your liabilities, that's a good sign. But if you put the, the value of this note on Renfrew Hydro's uh, books as a current liability, uh, they would be in a negative position from a, from a current asset uh, ratio perspective. So it's, it's strictly financial statement presentation. Um, it's a relatively new requirement under the International Financial Reporting Standards, the IFRS that they're referred to. And it's uh, basically looking for documentation to, to support the fact that uh, this, this liability uh, can be classified as long-term. Uh, appended to my report was, was a sample note from another um, hydro utility in the province, just showing that basically it's just referring to the fact that the, the municipality waives its right to demand payment. And the second part of that, uh, that attachment also shows just the type of wording that they're looking for in a sample letter. It doesn't in any way diminish the town's um, right to, to the uh, repayment of the note. It's just saying that right now there is no intention whatsoever to demand full repayment or even a partial repayment of that note during the calendar year 2021. And uh, as I said, this is a, a first time requirement or a first time request, but it will become an annual request going forward. And um, I did reach out to, to McKillican Associates, the auditors for Renfrew Hydro and did confirm, uh, received confirmation from them that they would be seeking a similar um, confirmation for Renfrew Power Generation when they get around to that audit. So this, this would waive the town's right for both of the corporations that are uh, solely owned by the municipality to to waive the requirement or to, to waive its right to demand repayment in the next uh, during 2021. Thank you. Any questions? Review more. Thank you. Relieved to know this is the first time and I didn't miss it like or misread it like I did Planner Withers uh, request for a meeting last month last week. Um, is this something that if we were to change the, the date, make it effective today and uh, run for five years, then Renfrew Hydro could use it when they went to their, uh, their hearings for the rate setting? Because I know that they've expressed some concern about this as a, as a drag on their ability to, to properly finance themselves. Through Mary, through Mary Edie to Revimo, uh, the, the concern that Renfro Hydro has is with the rate of interest being charged on the note, not the classification as current or long term. Um, it's strictly to do with, with the, uh, the underwritten obligation to pay at a, at a rate that's higher than the um, Ontario Energy Board is prepared to approve at this point in time. Any other questions? Thank you. Hearing none, all in favor? Terry. Renfrew Town Council authorized the clerk to provide confirmation to Renfrew Hydro Incorporated, RHI, that the town of Renfrew, as the sole shareholder of the corporation, has no intention of demanding payment for the promissory note in 2021. And further, that Renfrew Town Council authorized the clerk to provide confirmation to Renfrew Power Generation Incorporated, RPG, to the town of Renfrew, as the sole shareholder of the corporation has no intention of demanding payment of the promissory note in 2021. Mover, please. Councillor Evans, second by Reeve Emo. Uh, any further questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay. The Treasurer Riley's report dated March 17, 2021, including the annual statement of Council and Police Service Board remuneration and expenses for 2020 be received. Over, please. Councillor Evans, second by Councillor Hines. Again, uh, Treasurer Riley, do you want to give a short report on this? Yeah, this is fairly brief. The Section 284 of the Municipal Act requires that uh, I, as Treasurer of the Municipality, report to Council on the total remuneration and expenses paid to each council member in the previous calendar year. Uh, that has to be filed uh, prior to March 31st of each year. 
the statement at the top shows, um, and it's kind of a, an unusual one, that um, you have to report remuneration, which is the compensation for the position, and any expenses separately. And you'll see that the expense column shows absolutely nothing for the year 2020, uh, primarily because there were no travel and no conferences um, associated due to the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So the, no, no uh, costs were incurred at all. So what's reported is the remuneration based on the, the base salary for the council reeve and uh, mayor positions, as well as the additional compensation that comes along um, as for, for the chairs of the various committees and the uh, chairing the various committee meetings. So that's why there's a, that's why there's a difference from one council member to the next. It depends on who is chaired, uh, which meetings and things like that. So it is, it is a requirement of the Municipal Act and this fulfills that requirement for uh, the calendar year 2020. Okay, any questions? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Gary. Okay, that the, the minutes from the Fire and Emergency Management Committee meeting held on March the 16th, 2021, be received. Over, please. Councillor Hines, second by Councillor Jamison. Turn it over to Councillor Hines for the report. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is our Fire and Emergency Management Committee meeting held uh, March 16th. And um, we had a delegation from Mr. Andrew Dick of RC Fireworks, and that came to us um, from our council meeting of February 23rd, uh, Mr. Dick's request in regard to selling fireworks and how it works with our bylaw. And uh, we did uh, have Mr., um, we had a Zoom meeting, so Mr. Dick did join us. Um, virtually and uh, the committee uh, were very keen on asking questions about where and how we plan to uh, sell the fireworks and also um, we're concerned in regard to the storage of the fireworks and um, so we had a copy of our bylaw and we also had a copy of several other the chief uh, did a marvelous job securing other bylaws for us that we were able to, um, to look at. And uh, we've left it where the chief is um, uh, putting together a potential amendment to the wording uh, for the committee for April that we can review that and see if that's, if that's gonna work. Our prime um, concern is, is certainly um, the safety of people when uh, when the um, uh, when there's storage of fireworks, when there is a sale of fireworks, so we just we just want to make sure that the community is safe uh, when that's happening, and that was the reason for the bylaw before. So that will be coming to our April meeting. Uh, we also had joining us uh, Mike Forche and uh, uh, Clerk Balmer, and uh, we had a good discussion in regard to what the nature and the timing of our annual emergency plan exercise and training might be. And uh, we're looking to do that um, somewhere in the summer or early fall. And um, we will, we're hoping to stage it just like an emergency. So it will, it will happen and uh, people will be fit in their roles. And if they happen to be absent, then their alternates would be required to be there. So um, we're working through that and uh, we have a pretty unique um, idea of the nature of the emergency. And uh, we're not going to be sharing that until after the emergency so that people just react to um, exactly what they need to know and what we need to learn from that and where the training needs to happen after uh, we do the debrief on the emergency. So um, the chief and uh, the emergency um, team are working on that. Uh, the chief provided the, uh, uh, the activity report uh, for February 2021. And also uh, he'll be bringing a little highlight of that to you in a moment. But um, we also uh, spoke about the provincial government had an announcement on March the 11th 
of a grant and some funding that could be available to the municipality. Uh, the, <laughs> the funny part of this is, or <laughs> the very um, quick turnaround time had to be by March 19th, which was last Friday. But uh, the chief did have some really awesome ideas in regard to uh, what we might use the money for. And it was for training priorities um, in this one-time grant. And I will let him highlight that to you. The grant has been submitted and hopefully we'll get that money. Um, it relates to, because of COVID, you know, the firefighters aren't able to go away for training, but the Chief has, Chief has been very innovative in regard to how we might use that money for in-house training, et cetera. So I'll let him review that in a moment. And um, just under noon on finished business, we again spoke of our 2021 priorities and where we're going on that. And um, also we have some standing items, the employee assistance program, uh, the fire master plan, and of course, uh, the tiered response in in the leg group, the local efficiency group. So nothing really to report on those items at this time. Um, so if I could, through you, your worship, turn it over to the chief to have him highlight the February 2021 um, activities report and just a little highlight in regard to the uh, grant. Chief Welsh. On mute. Caught that from me. <laughs> it, it's a, an exclusive uh, functionality of being on the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I think that everybody has had, had an opportunity to review the contents of the uh, monthly review report. Uh, we see that our, our fire call total uh, continues through this month of February, the second month, to climb over the uh, year over year compared to last year. We're up about 45 calls now compared to 31 last year. Uh, last year, we had seen a drop in our calls for the first few months of the year. And overall, throughout the entire year, we were lower than the previous year of 2019. But I'm certainly hoping that this increase in number of calls is not indicative of the fact that our uh, our guard is down or that the community is uh, becoming a little bit uh, isolation exhausted and therefore uh, not necessarily having a, their minds turned to the, the safety elements that we would hope that they'd have as an ongoing consideration for, for daily life. Um, but 45 calls is, is not astronomical. Um, there are, as I've said in the past, we have not had some of the adverse effects associated with the pandemic that other communities have had and or continue to have as, as Oshawa did yesterday. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware, but there was a house fire yesterday in Oshawa. There was potentially, well, as of this morning, there was two lives lost and two lives unaccounted for. Uh, the structural integrity of the building was such that they couldn't continue to do the search. So I would hope we could take a moment to give our thoughts and prayers to the families in Oshawa who are, are dealing with this tragedy, but we have been blessed here in our community. And I think we should uh, thank our our continued diligence of our uh, committee or our community members and, and taking care of themselves and each other. Um, we did have the opportunity to assist our neighboring communities in two different fires that they had, Admast and Bromley. We were out to assist them on a Tuesday night with a structure fire that they had and Horton, we provided water supply for a structure fire on Burnstown Road, uh, just at Fraser Road that had, uh, again, a no loss of life, but uh, unfortunately a, a displacement of a family. The uh, Admast and Bromley fire was a uh, commercial operation that saw the loss of the building and some equipment inside. Um, the, the magnitude of which in each case is still, I think, uh, being totally uh, uh, totaled up, but I don't think that uh, we will see too much of a, a investigation on those. I don't know the causes of both of those have been established yet. We're still waiting for that. To go down into the uh, activities that we have, uh, our, our training continues to be a primary focus for us as we always want to be as diligent and preparing for the moments if they happen to be able to respond to our community. Um, we continue to do the work that we need to do in stations to minimize our, our costings and contracting out of our work as far as equipment maintenance and, and building repairs. Uh, you'll see that we have continued to have our COVID cleaning. Our, 
In the county, we were the only fire service that was identified as a uh, part of the medical response. Therefore, our firefighters were able to uh, engage in the first level of vaccinations that were made available most recently. And they have, uh, I think all our members have had their first shots, which is awesome. Uh, that being said, though, we still continue to be diligent in all the preparatory work and, and basic uh, protections that we provide for ourselves and, and everybody that we work with by maintaining physical distancing, maintaining masking where we can't maintain that physical distancing and the ongoing cleaning of commonly touched services. So we still see that as a, an element associated with our, our tasks. Uh, and of course, the, the one opportunity that we have to give a little bit of a respite for people within our community, the uh, recreational open air burning permits. Um, this month we sold four. Uh, to 2020, we sold four as well, but uh, we are now to year to date at 15 sales. Uh, which is a comparison to last year to our total sales for 2020 of 45. So uh, we seem to be a, in a, a steady renewal and some new uh, sales on, on those, which is nice to see that people have the chance to stay within their family units, stay within their family bubbles and still get the chance to enjoy some recreational activities in their homes that uh, provide them with some joy and, and a little bit of a draw away from the, the matters that we're dealing with. To speak uh, ever so briefly to the single or one-time grant that was provided by the provincial government through the Ontario Fire Service. Um, there was an opportunity to receive a minimum of a $4,500 grant, and then there was a proportion of a population that was subsidized in, in excess of that for each community. Our grant value for the town of Renwood Fruit was $6,600, and as, the, as Madam Chair had identified, uh, the, there was two priorities that these were um, intended to be apply to as best as possible. Uh, one was the fire prevention elements that may have been curtailed to some extent through the COVID lockdown. And the other was to try and find ways to increase our uh, access and our opportunity for training. Um, what uh, has been identified in that short turnaround as uh, was referenced by the, the chair, uh, we received notice on the 11th of March from the fire marshal's office through a um, conference call or a Zoom meeting. Um, and there, the, the fire marshal was rather apologetic and understandably so in that the all the monies had to be identified through an application process by the 19th of March back to the fire marshal's office for approval and distribution or through contract of distribution by the 31st of March. Um, so the provincial government had uh, very tight timelines associated with this. We identified in our opportunity within training for the town of Renfrew to utilize the money for uh, upwards of at least 10 copies of our current uh, International Fire Service Training Association manual, the, the current edition of that, the IFSA 7. Uh, they're about $135 per unit, so we will be hopefully getting up for enough of those that we have a, a particular um, training manual and workbook for each one of our members of the fire service that allows to helps to reduce the exposure that they would experience by sharing materials that would give them the opportunity uh, especially with our volunteers to be uh, at home in their safe uh, environment, making the preparations that they need to make to come into the, the station to do our training. And that allows us a greater opportunity to do our practical training, and minimize our, our amount of time associated in a, a larger group doing a theoretical approach to things. So the, that was one of the applications that we had. The second application that we were looking at is there is a DVD series out that uh, all our standards are associated through the uh, NFPA, the NFPA, Firefighter 2 standard is a comprehensive standard that includes all the elements of competency that they look for within the fire service. There is a, a 10 video set that allows us to have that same safe uh, individual preparation associated with the, the, uh, prep, the, the learning of the, these essential skill sets that they would have to have. And we uh, will be hopefully picking that set up. It's about a 23 or $2,400 purchase for those 10 videos. And the final opportunity that we saw in, in, in hopes of applying these funds as a result of the fire college bricks and mortar portion being closed, the fire college will continue to exist and it offers online um, and, and blended programming. And part of the blended programming, it requires in-person training and the absence of the Graven Nurse facility creates a demand to attend regional training centers. We have two individuals that are being trained to a level of uh, training delivery. It's a certification called 1041 level two, which is a fire safety instructor. Uh, so these competencies will be achieved through the blended course, but they also need to attend 
the Rockland campus of a regional training center for two weekends. And we are using the monies associated with this grant to uh, offset the costs associated with sending those individuals down. This provides us with a qualified and competent individual, not once but twice, uh, added to our portfolio in the town that we can then use to train our, our on-duty staff and, and our volunteers to make sure that we're at the level of competency that we need to be at. So those uh, identified projects were sent off to the fire marshal's office last Friday afternoon. And uh, the expectation is that the fire marshal's office will send a, a letter back to myself establishing a um, a, a provincial agreement on to the transfer of those monies and we'll be able to get those to the council. Unfortunately, the, uh, the timings with the uh, submissions weren't such that we could get council's approval and the fire marshal was very cognizant of the, the potential of that, but uh, they've done everything they can to get the money into our hands so that we can put it to the best use possible to make sure our, our communities and our firefighters are safe. So, uh, if there are any questions, I'll try and field them. Any questions, council? There are none. And all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay, the, the minutes of the Parks and Recreation uh, Facilities Committee meeting held March 16, 2021, be received. Mover, please. Councillor Kula, seconded by Councillor Hines. Uh, maybe we'll ask Director Hill uh, if it's okay with you, uh, Councillor Kula, to uh, give a short report on that meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Eady. Uh, just uh, to recap uh, the meeting of uh, March the 16th, we had a, a number of uh, communications that were sent in to the department, just uh, basically congratulating or thanking uh, staff for the efforts for the outdoor facilities that were offered throughout the uh, winter months at uh, Mattaway. So we, we reviewed those minutes. Um, Mary D did comment that a number of people had contacted him um, complimenting the activities as well. Uh, so we uh, passed the motion and uh, Chair Sydney had asked that we pass on the uh, thanks to the staff, which uh, we will do. We also received a letter from the Templar Knights uh, Motorcycle Club who host an annual uh, Toys for Kids ride on Saturday, August the uh, 19th. They've, they've had this ride for a number of years um, at our facility. The, the, the ride's been um, taking place for nine years. I believe they've been at our facility for the last four or five. Uh, they've asked for the, uh, the Visitors Information Center at no charge for that date. So the committee is recommending to council that the uh, Templar Knights request be approved and that the daily fee of $150 be reimbursed from grants to organizations. We also discussed as, as the March meeting, which we do every year, um, our fees for service bylaw, our fees for services to add to the bylaw. Uh, and it was felt by staff this year, given the, the year of COVID, uh, that we would not increase any of our fees uh, for the years 2021, April 2021 till March 31st, 2022. And the uh, committee did recommend that for council and that fees for service bylaw will be uh, forthcoming uh, typically in the month of April for uh, council's review and endorsement. We did talk about um, the second ice pad, uh, just a, an update, the expansion. Uh, I reviewed a letter that was uh, received from the second ice pad committee, uh, Chair uh, Jim Miller um, and uh, Scott Buffum, and uh, provided an update on the expansion. Uh, we did talk about uh, a report that I had sent to the ad hoc committee, uh, just outlining the project status update last week. Uh, dealing with the design, engineering, naming rights, uh, grants, and construction management. And I did ask the committee uh, for direction moving forward uh, so that we can continue working um, as we await announcement of a grant. Uh, so the committee is recommending or did direct staff uh, to forward the revised drawings once completed to Sullivan and Hine for their review and preparation of an updated estimate and schedule. So I will be doing that 
uh, probably early next week when the design uh, drawings are done, we'll pass those on to the, uh, to the uh, pre-qualified um, construction management company to uh, prepare a uh, revised budget and a schedule. The BIA uh, watering, uh, we've been approached uh, through uh, Councillor Coolis to uh, water the flowers for the BIA possibly uh, for this upcoming season. Uh, they did have a changeover of um, their, uh, their board of directors. So we are waiting to hear back. Uh, Councillor Coolis is gonna get back to us on their decision with that, uh, with that issue. And I just brought the uh, committee up to date that, uh, that I have been working with the uh, people at the uh, hospital uh, to discuss the uh, hosting of the vaccination center. And, and we did pass a motion uh, that the committee instructs staff to immediately cancel all programming at Mattaway Activity Center to host the vaccination center uh, when that uh, facility is needed for that service. And the uh, meeting was adjourned at 441. Yeah, thank you. Any questions, Council? Councillor Hines. Um, just one quick question, and I don't really have a problem with waiving the fee. Uh, it is just $150 for the use of the information center that Templar Knights do a great service to the community and area. But um, I'm just uh, wondering, I know we've waived, or recreation has waived some fees previously. So are those all coming out of grants to organizations? Because I just think that that process was, there is a, a set process there in that um, when organizations require funding, they have to make an application to the town and then we have a set amount and we just take it out of there. Now, I do take it from this motion that the $150 is just basically a paper transfer, but it is monies coming $150 out of the grants to organizations budget that will flow back to recreation for that, uh, the, that revenue that belongs to the Tourist Information Center. That, that's that's the intent or that's the direction that I have received um, because a lot of our grants to organization or uh, free facility rentals in the past we've just waived the fee. Uh, we have started the process of of taking all free rentals out of grants to organization, um, and I was directed by Treasurer O'Reilly to word our um, motions this way. Uh, so that he would then transfer the money based on the approval of council. Okay, good clarification on that. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I'm oh, sorry, Kirk, Kirk Palmer. Oh, I just, <clears throat> just for the sake of clarity, <clears throat> we did pull that motion out. So there'll be a standalone motion just to deal with that, uh, that waiving of rental and uh, charging it to the associated grants to organization budget, just... Okay. To throw that out there. Coming next. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Next motion here. All in favor. Terry. Okay. This is a motion uh, Clerk Palmer was uh, referring to. The Renfrew Town Council approved the request of the Templar Knights MC to use a uh, visitor information center on August 19, 2021 for the ninth annual Toys for Kids ride and further Renfrew Town Council waive the associated rental fee for the use of the grants of two organizations by over please. Councillor Hines, second by Councillor Coolis. Any questions? All in favor? Carried. <coughs> that the minutes of the Waste Management Committee meeting held March the 1st, 2021 be received. Over, please. Revimo, second by Councillor Hines. Turn it over to Revimo for the report. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we met on March the 1st. It was an electronic meeting, of course. Um, I'll take you down to item number eight. Hard tonnage year-over-year uh, -year comparison. It's pretty close to last year at this time. Um, we're changing the formatting a bit to get more comparative numbers for, for last year. Um, Golder is working on 
our 2020 landfill environmental monitoring and operations reports. It'll essentially tell us how much how much we actually put in and how how much space we used up and and give us a ballpark figure on our uh, our life our life uh, expectancy of the site. Um, as you remember, the compactor had uh, had went down for a while, and uh, our staff argued successfully that the unit. Uh, was a factory sealed unit and couldn't be lubricated. So when it seized up, it wasn't really our problem. Um, and so the repair was covered under warranty. We had to cover travel expenses to complete the repair. We had just edged past the warranty period as well, unfortunately. So that caused some pretty intense and successful discussions. So thank you to staff for that. We have two reserve funds associated with the landfill, the environmental reserve with approximately 120,000. Um, and we're eyeing it for the five-year program to purchase the water uh, the water rights, uh, groundwater acquisition rights uh, between the site and the Bonshire River. There are a number of properties along there and we started approaching some of the owners and they've approached us as well. And that's part of our recommended uh, plan going forward under the certificate of approval. Bonshire, approximately 390,000 in, uh, in a reserve and it's to cover landfill closure costs. Um, <clears throat> the Approximate cost is between one and two million. So currently we're setting aside 50,000. If we have approximately 20 to 22 years left, we should be very close to having the proper amount. We may have to, probably not in this term of council, but another term of council that, that 50,000 might have to be indexed to inflation to, to ensure that uh, if the price tag is three or four million, just because it's 20 years down the road that we have enough money. So that might be something we come back to council with in the next little while. Uh, legal fees are in the 2021 landfill uh, operational budget. So recycling, we had a great conversation about recycling um, and uh, trying to assist staff in responding to some complaints. Uh, occasionally people get missed. Uh, occasionally, sometimes we think they they don't quite get it out on time and they assure us they do. So we're, we're trying to figure out a way to make that a little, a little more seamless. Um, and uh, a good question brought up by, I believe, Councillor Evans. Do we get any money back? And yes, we do. We get money back from Antera um, for a rebate on uh, revenues for processed recyclable material. Um, likely, likely cardboard, uh, but we don't know for sure. We'll know more, but we will be getting some funds back periodically. Um, and next... Um, we are going to take a look at the uh, waste management bylaw. Um, we have, we're getting MLS in to have a chat with us and we're, we're going out to uh, talk to the multi-residential unit owners um, just to start planning a future recycling program and, and any changes to the bylaw to assist uh, them in getting their, their waste uh, out for collection. Um, and the fatal flaw in most directions is me and I haven't, uh, provided a list of potential meeting dates. I will do that. Thankfully, we get minutes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have remembered that. We're going to sit down with the multi-residential unit owners and, and just have a nice frank conversation, uh, share a vision of what, what we hope and listen to their vision and see if we can find a spot in the middle. Public engagement. Uh, we check to make sure that uh, when we're reviewing the waste management bylaw that we don't have to host a public meeting, but we wanted to get, hear from the public. So we're going to put together a survey and get it out and collect the results. So we're working on the questions for the next meeting. Um, stage four and five timeline. We just want to make sure we're aware of them and, and plan towards that future. And the groundwater easement uh, I mentioned earlier. So we're, we are meeting with an owner. Or staff will meet with an owner so we're our way through that. Um, we recognize that there are some times when people put out more trash bags than, than our bylaw uh, allows for, and that causes some, some conversations. And uh, so we're gonna try and figure out ways to reduce, you know, help people with information about reducing their, their uh, trash uh, that they put out. And uh, so we're working on that. Grinding, again, uh, last year we pulled out um, we pulled out mattresses and we're doing wood and shingles. Uh, we're trying to find other materials, uh, plastics, small toys. Uh, so we're gonna have some conversations with the, uh, the operator um, just to allow us to compact better and to break things down so we don't take up space. With that, uh, we close the meeting off and we're scheduled to meet on Tuesday, April the 6th. 
And that's my report on behalf of uh, Mayor Eady and Councillor Evans. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions on the report? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Harry. Okay. Next is the minutes of the Development Works Committee meeting held March the 9th, 2021, be received. Over, please. Councillor Coolis, seconded by Councillor Evans. Turn it over to Councillor Coolis for the report. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this was a meeting held on the 9th of March, electronically, of course. Um, just touching on some of the highlights, uh, we did receive um, the application and issued the permit for this first 63 units of the Lapine project um, on uh, Barnett Boulevard. Uh, we are going to deal tonight, I think, following this report uh, with waterworks and uh, drinking water quality management and, and our aqua annual report. So I won't touch on those at this time. I don't want to steal the director's thunder on that. Um, we did uh, make application to get a um, get a piece of property that we currently have an easement on uh, behind 29 Arthur Avenue uh, along the Boncher River. Uh, that is uh, in review as we speak. Um, we also we already dealt with uh, the vacancy of a foreman. Um, uh, at the last council meeting, I believe. Um, uh, we did uh, recap some of the complaints we had received about um, uh, 8th Street, some concerns there uh, with uh, our new member of our committee, uh, Councillor Sidney. Um, winter level of service was also, was also discussed. Um, we, we, it's a contentious issue with us and the county with regard to snow removal on, um, on the county owned roads like Bruce Street and Raglan Street South, uh, where they do not, they do not uh, reimburse the town for snow removal or, or uh, removal of uh, snow and ice on the sidewalks on those, on those uh, throughways. Um, Asset management was discussed as well uh, concerning municipal drinking water. Um, construction on, uh, on Stewart Street will continue uh, likely uh, next month. It will start again, as well as Raglan Street South. Those projects, both of them, should be completed by October of this year, 21. We do have um, a contractor ready to start on um, the current water tower, uh, better known as a standpipe. Um, that contractor indicates that he'll need it for uh, a period of between May and August, which is a pretty long timeline to not have the, um, the water tower to have it out of service. So we are, we are working with them to see if we can't get that shortened up a little bit. Um, we had a closed session and um, that was it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions on the report? Okay, hearing none. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Okay. That the following documents arising from the minutes of the Development Works Committee meeting held March 9, 2021, be received. Drinking Water Quality Management System, DWQMS, Top Management Review 2020 Report. Drinking Water System, Annual Water Report 2020, prepared, prepared by Operating Authority, the Ontario Clean Water Agency, OCWA and the Town of Renfrew Waterworks Report. Need a mover on this, please. Councillor Cole is seconded by Councillor uh, Hines. I'll turn it over to Director Aslan for the report. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Edie and Council. Uh, these three reports uh, have been included in tonight's package 
more for transparency purposes, uh, the municipal council uh, after the Walkerton tragedy have a lot of responsibility to to be aware of uh, what's happening with the drinking water system. And uh, these three reports here tonight uh, very much summarize some of the activity and should give a level of confidence to, uh, to the council that, uh, that the town systems are being operated. Um, the full documents uh, for the DWQMS haven't been presented. It's a fairly large binder, but the information is available at Development Works Office. The uh, management report is an internal staff review that, that I do each year to confirm that the 21 elements of our quality management system are in fact uh, being adhered to. And uh, this reviews the internal audits, the external audits, the operation plans, risk assessments, and various other elements of the, uh, of the drinking water quality management standard. Uh, I can assure council on DWQMS that uh, our system is in good shape and we conform. I think there was only one area where we had an opportunity for improvement, uh, which is part of a regular cycle where, where we plan, do, and review. And uh, so that we often, uh, at the end of it, have an opportunity for improvement to, um, to you know, change the system a little bit and, uh, and keep improving it each year. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any questions at all on the drinking water quality management standard uh, document. Maybe I'll do one at a time. Okay. Any questions, Council? Review more. Uh, thank you again. Just to get some clarity, um, th this doesn't have page numbers, so I'm going to suggest it's about five pages in, and it's called Changes to Quality Management System, and it says the operation plan was amended June 9th. Is that something that happens every five years or 10 years, just for my information? It, it's not on a regular cycle, but uh, the various elements are amended from time to time. So in this year, the operation plan will be brought forward to council to, to refresh it. Our, our existing operation plan for the distribution system is from 2015. And, but there, there have been various elements that have been amended uh, through the policies. So, uh, so our engineering, uh, environmental engineering officer will be bringing forward an amendment to our operation plan to, to make it current in 2021. Okay, thank you. I, I have two more questions, Your Worship, if that's okay. Fine, yes. Uh, and on the back of that page, it's called consumer feedback and it says staff to continue to track customer feedback. So is that um, just as people call in or is there some kind of a structured um, asking of questions or, or feedback? Yes, the, uh, the department maintains a database of uh, concerns and complaints. So anybody that calls in from brown water uh, to a question about chlorine levels uh, are all monitored within our database. And, uh, and we use that to summarize the, uh, the level of, uh, you know, any questions that we've had on the water system. Uh, the database also includes all the winter control and other areas of development works as well but we can just pull out the, uh, the questions related to the water system and summarize them in, in our uh, annual reports. Thank you. And, and uh, I, just further down that page, resources for quality management system, middle of the paragraph, um, it talks about the works foreman and, and, and Mr. Butler. Um, that sentence is a little unclear before you put it in the public domain. Uh, just, you might want some clarity on it, but. That's a pretty minor thing, but it's just something I noticed. Okay, thanks. So that's it on the drinking water quality report. If there's no other questions, um, I'll also review uh, just quickly the drinking water system annual report. Uh, so this is a report that's prepared by Aqua and is a requirement of the uh, Ontario regulations uh, to summarize the activities at the water treatment plant and also to make this report available to the public. Um, if you look through the report itself, uh, there's elements of uh, summaries of non-compliance. Uh, there's flow rate information and a bunch of uh, regulatory sample information. So what's interesting in this, uh, in this report here is uh, we did not have any adverse water quality incidents uh, during last year, which is, which is good. 
there was one minor non-compliance during the reporting period, and there was a sample related to the residuals treatment on the ActaFlow system. Uh, that uh, that was one sample was missed out of uh, tens of thousands of uh, samples uh, taken. So that uh, did we we've recently received an inspection report. And uh, we still are rated at 100% on our water system. So this minor non-compliance uh, did not affect uh, the risk associated with the water system. Um, if you look at the sections related to flow rates, that's uh, on page three of the report, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, there's a line at the 18,000 cubic meter per day mark. Uh, that, that is the capacity of our treatment system. We're generally in the three to five, three to 5,000 cubic meters a day. So we're operating our water plant at about 22% of its capacity. So that, that is uh, good to know when we're looking at industries or other growth. Uh, so we're in good shape on our water plant. Um, on page four, there's an interesting trend that, that supports the information that we've received in our water and sewer rate study in that the, the volumes of water uh, that have been uh, produced at the plant continue to decline as a result of declining consumption. So from 2010 to 2020, over that 10 year period, the, uh, the decline in the, the demand in the system it declined by 46%. And that's primarily due to water conservation uh, better appliances, and uh, that that puts pressure on our our revenues um, derived from uh, consumption of drinking water. So, in our drinking water uh, rate study, there was some discussion about the uh, the funds collected through base charges versus the funds collected through through um, the consumption charges, and with declining water rates or not rates, but with declining water consumption. Um, it's more difficult each year to, uh, to achieve our, our targets as far as revenue. Um, there is a summary of many uh, parameters uh, related to water quality and, uh, and they're all in, in good shape with no non-compliances of any uh, chemical or, or biological or, uh, or other parameters in our drinking water. So, uh, so it's a, essentially a very good report and uh, there's no concern that should be uh, had by council as far as our drinking water supply and, and how it's being operated. So if there's any questions on the drinking water system annual report, uh, I'll take them now, but this report is being made available on the, on the internet, on the website, and as well as uh, being available free of charge at our office uh, uh, if somebody wants to come and take a look at it. Any questions on that part, Council? Okay, hearing none, you want to go ahead. Okay, the, uh, the third and final report is uh, the Waterworks report for 2020. And essentially, this document is a summary of the activities uh, taking place anywhere from uh, water being turned on and off, uh, meters being replaced. Uh, valves being turned and hydrants being repaired or water main breaks. Uh, there's a lot of flushing that takes place uh, on the systems for dead ends, like the chlorine levels as they, uh, as they sit in the pipes, uh, the chlorine decays over time and we're obligated to maintain minimum uh, levels of chlorine at all the dead end uh, runs on the water system. So from time to time, we uh, do need to, to go and open up the hydrants and get water flowing. So that would be in the flushing section. But uh, this, this constitutes kind of a record of the maintenance that has been done on the water system and, uh, and certainly is reviewed at, at the external audits and as well as the internal audits uh, each year when we uh, take a look at our water system. So, so if there's any questions uh, on that report, I'll, uh, I'll take them as well. Okay. Any further questions, uh, Council? Okay. Hearing none, all in favor? Terry, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Next motion is a re-BMO uh, be heard before Council to provide an update on the Eastern Ontario Regional Network uh, Orange Gig Project. Over, please. 
Councillor Evans, second by Councillor Coolis. Uh, can we review more? We'll look for your report. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr. Balmer has it for screen share. I, I apologize to Council. I made a request to your end for um, a presentation, but they, they've had some big announcements. I'll talk a little bit about that and suggest that I could uh, probably just take some information and put something together. So it's uh, quite different. Um, so today, now is the time to truly solve the lack of access to modern high-speed broadband uh, for rural Ontario and businesses. Um, investment's gonna be needed to grow the regional and provincial and national economy. Uh, today's economy is digital and it's a key component in economic development. The COVID-19 pandemic laid bare the massive, uh, and I can't stress how large the divide is between uh, rural and urban Canada when it comes to accessing high speed internet services. Each one of us have been in, involved in numerous Zoom meetings where somebody freezes and, and the most famous phrase uh, in 2020 is, can you hear me now? Um, so I think, I think we're all aware of that uh, and uh, suffer from it. Um, online, an online business survey conducted by the Eastern Ontario Leadership Council, 57% uh, of the more than 250 participants identified internet connectivity and high-speed internet as the most significant barrier to the growth in our region. And if you could move on, Mr. Ballner, please. So just a little bit of history. <clears throat> Policy, December 2016, I was part of the Warden's Caucus and, and uh, went with the year end to make a presentation to CRTC uh, about making broadband an essential service. And so they, um, they also ruled on that day, you know, at that time that the expected fixed broadband internet access at speeds of at least 50 MIPS download and 10 MIPS upload known as a 5010 to be available to 90% of Canadian premises by the end of 2021. And then the remaining 10% of Canadian premises within 10 to 15 years. At that time, we were sort of satisfied with that. Um, we thought, wow, that's, uh, but then the last five years have, have shown us that that's not even close to being adequate. In 2019, 46% of rural homes and businesses in Eastern Ontario had access to 5010 and 63% uh, did not. Um, Eastern Ontario achieves, with this policy, Eastern Ontario would achieve 5010 around 2030 or 2035. And it's our contention that that's not, not fair nor right. Um, so it's been suggested and, and on July 24th, uh, the economic recovery update delivered by the Eastern Ontario Leadership Council, the projected impact of COVID on annual decrease in gross domestic product in Eastern Ontario is about 3.1 billion and could increase to between 5.4 and 6.7 by January, 2021. So COVID has, has caused a decline. And then you add in the, 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 natu the handicap we have of inadequate uh, broadband. Um, and just, uh, there's a, a quote, lack of adequate broadband and cellular is impacting all sectors. Um, and, it, and the costs, you know, operational costs have increased dramatically. The gig project. So before I get to the gig project, just wanna remind you phase one of the broadband project uh, for Renford County uh, was completed about 2012. The investment uh, was $848,000 by the county. The coverage was a total household, the total households in uh, Renford County are about 39,500. 29,000 of them were covered at up to uh, 10, 10 MIPS up, upload speed. So the coverage was about 74 and a half percent. And there is some satellite coverage as well. And uh, you've heard about the recent cell gap analysis and the, and the very successful uh, announcement last week. Um, and so with that, what it is is that um, Rogers uh, won, the, uh, won the RFP. And so they will be providing uh, services over the next five years. Uh, they're suggesting it's going to potentially create more than 3,000 new jobs with uh, 420 million in, in local economic growth. Um, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus and the Mayor's Caucus, which is, is representing 113 communities, is putting in $10 million. The provincial government and the federal government have each committed $71 million, and the remainder will be from Rogers, which is $150 million approximately. So that's, a very, that's very good news, but that only solves part of the problem. 
for us. And that's why there's the request for, for the gig project. And it, uh, it is a project that allows um, larger, larger usage, more necessary news usage. And it is a, um, after, after a very significant, uh, after a very significant uh, uh, review of, of, the, um, of the project, um, it's gonna so solve some of the problems for our generation. Uh, the cost of getting one uh, GP, uh, one gig of service to 95% of the residents is, is about 1.6 billion with a contribution of 450 million from the federal and provincial governments. That there is a suggestion from uh, an economic analysis that that will increase GDP by 300 million annually and create more than 9,700 new jobs. It would also increase home values by 3% and po property tax revenue by 20 million. Um, so we did, they did a very quick uh, analysis. Um, it'll also uh, reduce healthcare costs, delivery costs by 4% or more than $170 million annually. This would allow us to attract more new residents, of course, and new businesses. Uh, people can live further from their urban jobs. Um, cost comparison estimates very quickly, the 50, 10 to 95 for the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus would be between 500 million to 750 with an estimated cost to Renford County of about 51 million. Uh, the one gig to 95% is about 1.2 billion to 1.6 with an estimated cost to Renford County of $211 million. Um, so there, and just a, a cost estimate was based on 30 meters per, uh, per meter, so, sorry, $30 per meter for fiber. Um, this uh, allows us to, what we're suggesting with the motion that you're gonna be seeing in a few minutes is that it's a coordinated regional project will eliminate a piecemeal approach from other sectors, uh, municipal governments and, and agencies, as well as hospitals and the schools would all need to apply it and put together separate projects. Uh, and we think that's costly. Um, and the projects aren't gonna be done without, aren't gonna be completed without provincial subsidy. Um, so what we've suggested to you is that, that it's best uh, to allow um, a regional approach. It's good money, good money value. Um, and what has happened is it's, it's based on a, a market failure analysis. There's a market demand and nobody's going to be able to meet it unless somebody takes a lead role and designs a, a larger system and can find some efficiencies because of that. So that's what this is and it'll allow, the new funds will allow that rural students can study online, uh, healthcare can carry on um, and also <clears throat> telemedicine and families can connect to uh, their loved ones in various other areas. And so with that, um, what we're suggesting is that the following resolution meets the needs for our region so this is entirely separate from the first project we talked about, which was completed, and the second project that was won, won by Rogers. This is a fixed line fiber last mile project. And so it allows, it allows greater functioning um, for, your, for your homes. Um, you can uh, use a lot more, uh, a lot more bandwidth. Um, it's a wire line or fiber direct to the premise. And it, uh, it is better than, than what is out there. Some people are hanging their hats on satellite. Satellite's a great option, but it's only part of the option. It's, a, it's an option for hard to serve areas. Um, and so this is the best option for us, our community this time. So um, with your permission, your worship, I, I would read the, the motion. Uh We'll finish this first, and then we'll uh, okay. so, get to that. Uh, any questions on the report? Uh, I can't. Uh, I can't see everybody, but uh, so if you have any questions, speak up. Uh, Peter, I do, do you uh, have your copy in front of you, or can I yes, stop yes, I share? do. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yep. Yes, sir. Sorry. I've lost everybody in the screen. I got to start over here again. 
every time we put up one of them things that for some reason my screen goes completely blank so Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, question, uh, Redeemo, uh, on the cost, Renfrew County's cost, do I gather that Renfrew County is going to put in $260 million, $260 million into this? No, if there is not, if there's not uh, funding from the other two senior levels of government, um, and there would need to be about $500 million in, in loans uh, to the telecommunication service providers administered by um, ERN through the Canada Investment Bank. So there is a, there is a funding, there is a, a funding part, there's a part of the funding formula which, which talks of a long-term loan because if the reality is the 113 municipalities don't have that kind of money. Uh, the County Renfrew certainly doesn't have that kind of money, nor does the city of Pembroke, nor does any of the other 13 counties, 12 counties, sorry. Okay, I was concerned about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> quite a bit concerned about it, to be quite honest. Uh, we were very part, concerned when we uh, saw it too. <laughs> the other part of it is uh, down the road, uh, uh, let's say Rogers uh, has everybody set up, et cetera. And uh, is there any kickback uh, personally from them, or is it uh, Renfrew County just spend money and probably spend money, and at the end of the day, they make all the profit? The, um, the contract for the gig project, um, if it was to go to uh, someone like Rogers, would end up, there is a, um, an expectation that the infrastructure is shared. So, it's, so if I put up my tower, in theory now, I, I don't have to share it with you or, or another company. Um, there's a lot of pressure for them to do that. Uh, but th this is supposed to be a shared network. So it would be administered um, by ERN. Uh, similar to with the, the the first project, and now the second project will be administered by year end for, I believe, 15 years after the build. So the 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 cell project that's going forward announced last Friday should end about 2031, 2030, and will be administered for I believe 15 years after that. So I would assume that the gig project would be similar. That once it's built out, it would be it would be managed by the uh, by the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. It just uh, like when I looked at back years ago, uh, just as comparison, uh, uh, the pipeline came through uh, Renfrew County and the municipalities uh, all got well, well rewarded on a yearly basis, uh, tax wise back. And uh, this is uh, an information uh, highway, you may say. And uh, so I would hope that down the road that uh, we are very well compensated, you know, for somebody else who's not making a a huge profit at no cost. One of the thoughts is that uh, in the next layer of discussion is that the local municipalities would be canvassed to see if there's any infrastructure they could they could um, offer, which in essence would be put up for rent to, to put a tower on or a, a, some kind of a stick. So there is some opportunity for the local municipalities to get some funding back through through long-term leases and rentals, but it's, it's not defined yet. Uh, it's in early stages. I know uh, when they put up towers, there's no taxation money comes back off towers whatsoever. And that's by the federal government has mandated it that way. And, uh, and the federal government's also mandated that uh, anything to do with this, uh, municipalities have very, very little say in where any of this could go or what the structure will look like, uh, and put a tower just about any place they want. Uh, but municipalities have no say in it whatsoever. And, uh, so I, I don't know how far the county has went in trying to address some of these issues, but uh, they could be huge. Um, I, I, I won't speak for them uh, directly, but I know indirectly there has been uh, some presentations about, about those things, firstly. And then secondly, I know at, at Roma and uh, AMO, we've had some conversations about, about trying to trying to get some, some funding, get a funding stream from it, because we often are the first layer of complaint and secondly, um, municipalities have been investing a lot of money and time over the years to advocate for increased cell and broadband 
And uh, you know, I think most people are looking for some kind of a return. Um, so there is, you know, there is some suggestion of if it goes along a municipal right of way, there should be some kind of a fee. Uh, there is some conversations with the province about them talking to local utilities about the about utility pole replacement and, and the, co the higher cost of stringing uh, fiber on the poles, how, how that can be regulated or brought down. So there are layers of conversation. That is one of it is, is to bring the cost down, but secondly, also to offer some kind of reward or, or financial incentive to municipalities. It would be nice on a yearly basis if there was a check came through from uh, somebody who was making huge profits off uh, these things and uh, you know, just see, it doesn't seem fair, uh, you know, for uh, any level of government to be putting money into uh, into these things uh, with no return whatsoever. Uh, they say that's that kind of bothers me in a sense. I just think, uh, you know, what a way to run a business. Somebody else pays for it, and I get the profit. You know, it's for the most part, and. Yeah, it, it rankles. I've been chasing broadband since 2007 <laughs> in various projects, and. Uh, there's a lot of people make a lot of money off it. Um, you know, and some of them own sports networks and sporting teams. I'm not I one know. of them. I'm not <laughs> one of them. <laughs> no, I, I, I got shares in companies like that. No. <laughs> anyway, so that was my concerns on it. Uh, I, I do understand all the benefits uh, to the consumer out there, especially a small business uh, can set up uh you know, countryside uh, where there's no internet service now down the road and uh, they can operate literally from uh, a place that no longer that doesn't have it right now so that can open up a lot of avenues for the municipalities anyway any other any other questions from the uh, committee or for the council sorry okay hearing none all in favor okay the next we have the motion and revimo you have that in front of you you want to read it Yes, uh, we, we made a slight change to the one that's in your package. Um, yes. So whereas residents and businesses across our municipality and our region regularly need access to modern and adequate access to high-speed broadband services, and whereas the demand for high-speed broadband services will continue to grow year after year, and whereas our residents, businesses, and our neighboring municipal partners should not continue to be disadvantaged by lack of access to high-speed services. So that's a slight change recognizing our responsibility as a service hub. And this is a, this is a totally ad added new piece. And whereas our community is a service hub for health, commerce, and education to our surrounding rural community and needs to ensure we can meet the needs of our enlarged and rural service community with the assistance of high-speed broadband and services. And whereas the Eastern Ontario Regional Network has submitted a comprehensive regional project to deliver a gig up to a thousand MIGS, MIPS, sorry, of speed that will serve our residents and businesses long in the future. And whereas the year ends approach has often has proved itself very successful and represents an efficient and effective way to solve our broadband needs. Therefore, the council of the town of Brentford requests both the federal and provincial governments to immediately fund the ERN gig project. And finally, the letter of support with a copy of this resolution be sent to Minister Monsif, Minister Scott, with copies to member of parliament, Cheryl Gallant and member of provincial parliament, John Yakubuski. Okay. Need a mover for that motion, please. Councillor Jamison is second by Councillor Evans. Again, any further discussion on it? Okay. Hearing none. All in favor? Carried. Thank you, Council, for, for uh, indulging me. Okay. Next motion at the minutes of the Rent Republic Library Board meeting held February the 16th, 2021, be received. Did I miss something here? Just a second. Yep. Police Services Board. Police Services Board motion is next. Somehow I misplaced it here. I've seen it and I put it in the wrong pile or something. I can read it if. Uh, Why don't you read it if you don't mind? Okay, we have a motion that the minutes of the Renfrew Police Services Board meeting held November 18th, 2020, be received. Okay, uh, I found it, but we need to move her, please. Councillor uh, Kula, cool, second by Councillor Evans. Again, uh, the last, uh, I guess, Councillor Hines, if she wants to give her a short report on this. 
Sure, I can do that. Um, this is our meeting of November because the next meeting we had happened to be uh, last week, March 17th. We did not have a meeting in December, January, or February. Um, we do get weekly reports from the detachment commander, though, and um, have had several uh, communications from the chair uh, during that time. Uh, so we have gone back to meeting in person, uh, spaced apart, et cetera. So um, we just, as I said, had a meeting on March. So this is a little bit of old news, but um, the chair did bring forward um, some minutes from the BIA meeting and um, they were addressed. Some of them are um, municipal issues, but uh, nevertheless, the speeding issues uh, were addressed by uh, the chair and the, the board. And um, at that time, um, there was a, a speeding camera uh, and it was a spy cam, it's called a speed spy cam. And it was set up on Raglan Street South and since that time we've had other requests for it to be set up in other various places and we are able to um, see that data and uh, you know know if there is speeding there and uh, certainly then the detachment commander can um, move the forces to uh, patrol those areas uh, we had a look at the financial report for the end of the year and um, looked at uh, doing as we always have, purchasing the radio advertisement that we use um, within this year before they change any prices on that. And um, also we had a report from the detachment commander and very interestingly, um, the calls for service were down during that period that she was reporting on, which would be October, November. And uh, it's very much, I guess, related to COVID that people aren't out and about as much as they usually are. And um, yeah, so that was pretty much it. The um, We did submit our budget. Um, in the bottom of this, you'll see where the um, chair had asked uh, the two members, uh, member Vincent and Anderson to put together the budget for 2021. And that has been submitted to the finance or department. And um, we're, we'll be reviewing that uh, on Friday, actually. Okay, uh, any questions from council on this? Uh, I have a couple, uh, Chair Hines, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the, uh, you know, I noticed here about talk, they were talking about uh, more police presence on the main street. Uh, what was the reaction of the meeting from uh, the police point of view? Oh, the detachment commander is quite uh, amenable to that. That's not a problem. Um, that's something that she's very interested in and having... Uh, some of the um, the officers actually, you know, go into stores and there might not be a problem, but at least introduce themselves. We've just gone through a, a big period of uh, a lot of change uh, in regard to officers moving on to other positions and new officers coming in. So that's something that uh, that we've recently spoke about and you'll see that happening. Okay. Uh, back a few years ago when I was on it the It is police. a really positive thing for sure. Yeah. yeah. A few Sorry. years ago when I was on the police board, I asked for that and uh, it never did seem to happen. But uh, I think more presence from the police on the main street, uh, especially, would be a really, really good thing. Uh, there is uh, situations you see every once in a while on the main street where, uh, you know, things are going on that maybe if they were there, that they wouldn't happen. Yep. Uh, the other uh, question I have is on I, the, I will certainly bring that up again, though, appreciate um, that. based on your comments here. Appreciate that a lot. Uh, the other one is on the spy camera through uh, uh, Public Works uh, or Development Works. We'd ask that when we have a complaint 
on a certain street about speeding that uh, the OPP would put their camera up at the same time. Uh, now, I personally talked to uh, Inspector Ferguson on this and uh, nothing, nothing less than total cooperation. Uh, it's just a matter of us asking uh, for that to happen. I think we've done one street already with yes. that cooperation happening. And, uh, and going back to my time on the police board, I'd like to see, you know, if we can be more in coordination with each other. Uh, you know, we, we do pay a fair amount of money to have uh, the police presence. And uh, so it's, uh, it's good that we're, uh, I'd like to see these reports because then we can ask questions on the report. So that, that, to me, that's important. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Any other questions, Councilor? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Carry. Okay, next then is the minutes of the Rent for Public Library Board meeting held February the 16th, 2021, be received. Over, please. Okay. Councillor Evans, seconded by Revimo. Uh, Councillor Evans, do you want to give a report? Certainly, thank you. So, our uh, virtual meeting via Zoom held. February 16th. Um, <clears throat> despite the uh, second lockdown, the library still continues to be busy. Uh, one patron uh, provided some feedback. It was a new family. Best library services we've ever had, and we've lived in Toronto and Ottawa. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that both Mayor Watson and John Tory aren't listening. Uh, but, uh, thank you for that. Facebook uh, live events are going well with increased participation. It was a travel program with uh, 20 participants. Uh, monthly statistics for the month of January, uh, still gathering new patrons and curbside um, service is uh, being very well received and used. Business arising from the minutes. Uh, there was a small, uh, well, the start the storage room is um, uh, is almost complete with shelves needing to go back onto the walls. That then would be complete. Unfortunately, though, there was a hundred year old pipe in the programming room that sprung a leak. Uh, several walls needed to be ripped out and new piping installed. The town of Ranproof facility staff sprayed foam and did a lot of work as well in uh, repairing the damages and. Uh, renovating the building or room, sorry. Uh, carpets also needed to be replaced. Um, and at the time, everything was moved into the child uh, children's uh, library area, uh, hence its closure. Uh, unfortunately, almost around the same time, the sliding doors that are on Raglan Street uh, began to have uh, act up or provide issue. Uh, but uh, because of the flooding issue, which took priority, uh, they took a back step, but will be addressed uh, as uh, a next item to, uh, to be attended to. Um, updates on the architectural firm and uh, have been going well. So far, uh, two members of the uh, Vinten group have attended a, a preliminary meeting. Uh, they're an architecture and an engineer. Uh, and are already putting ideas together. Preliminary ideas were discussed and shared with the board members. Next step is to have an engineer visit, uh, as well as building measurements and preliminary drawings made. Uh, they will require input from other stakeholders. Uh, still on track for our October launch of drawings, that is. And um, our CAO will give us uh, an update when uh, they are available, shortly, hopefully. Um, signing officers, uh, we have now four of them. Uh, we need at least two signatures on any uh, documents uh, sent out through the library. And uh, our new representation from the township of Horton uh, is uh, Tracy Stevens, who's been invited to now sit on the board. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting her last month, uh, last meeting, uh, not last last week at most, and. Uh, She's very active and certainly uh, engages the board with a lot of questions. Um, she went over the review of the works, uh, the 2019 work plan. 
uh, board members were very happy to see how much work had been accomplished back in that time. And we also then reviewed the uh, CAO's report, uh, work plan, sorry, for the 2021 year. Uh, Greater Madawaska, there are still ongoing informal talks. Uh, this is again to provide library services in that township. Uh, possible rebranding, uh, the library is looking to uh, rebrand. Um, of course, uh, good old uh, Ontario Library Services. Um, uh, our um, chair was seeking volunteers to attend these virtual meetings. And uh, good old uh, Tom, Councillor Tom City stepped up and he will be uh, visiting to uh, virtual meetings a, per year. And finally, um, we went into a closed meeting to discuss the CAO yearly evaluation. Um, report cards were given to us uh, just around Christmas time. We submitted those to the chair and uh, we reviewed all those uh, findings. And that would conclude the rest of our meetings. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Okay, next at the library activity report for February, March 21st, 2021, sorry, be received. Uh, again, I need a mover, please. Uh, Councillor Evans, second by Revimo. Councillor Evans, do you want to give a quick report on this? Certainly. As always, our librarian does provide us, or chief librarian provides us with their activities report. Again, it's five pages. Um, it's an awful lot of text, but it does describe most, if not all of the programs that are taking place during the months of February and March. Um, it is a good read, and this information is available on both the town and the library's website. I would ask any members that do have questions or an interest that they please visit and have a, a quick read. I was just going to ask you that if it was available for the general public, and it is. So thank you. Uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want you to read the whole five pages. <laughs> but anyways, any questions on this? Hearing none. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Is there any uh, new or unfinished business? All right. Councillor Hines. Uh, Your Worship, I'm not sure if maybe this is your next um, uh, thing you're going to say, but I just um, would like to offer to Milt Stevenson's family um, our condolences. He did pass away on Friday evening, and um, certainly he was the Reeve of uh, Horton for some time, um, I think before your time, uh, before you became Reeve there. And um, certainly he was Reeve when we were going through all our uh, joining together on our amalgamation talks and, and um, was a very interesting and very knowledgeable fellow to deal with on that and very accommodating to Renfrew when, uh, when he was Reeve of Horton. So uh, our uh, thoughts and prayers are with them. Yes. And that was exactly what I, what I was going to speak on. Uh, I, I, I spoke to his uh, good wife, Vivian, this morning for uh, uh, 10 minutes or so. And uh, uh, Milt was, uh, uh, he made his mark in Horton. He made a good mark in Horton. Uh, he was a Reeve who, uh, he got the township uh, zoned residential, which was one of the, I don't think there was many of them in Renfrew County that were zoned that way. But that was his doings when he did that. Uh, Mill Stevenson was very instrumental in getting the Vulture Manor placed where it is today. Uh, between him and former Mayor Howie Harmis, uh, they got that through to get it over in this end of town uh, in the Health Village, uh, because the original talk was to move it to around the industrial park on the other end of town. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, he did some very good things. Uh, uh, Milk was totally respected uh, within the community and uh, did a, a tremendous job for the township of Harden. So again, on behalf of the uh, council and our staff, and the people of the town of Renfrew, we'll pass on our condolences to Vivian and her family. So thank you very much for that. It was simply an awesome high school teacher also. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a little after that. 
<laughs> or before that, sorry, Vivimo. He had the misfortune and I had the good fortune of him trying to teach me. Um, I can also say that he, you know, he served as warden uh, as well of the county, he did a, just a spectacular job in representing the community um, at the provincial level. Um, and I can, I also uh, served as his campaign manager when he ran, ran federally. So Milton and I had a lot of time on the road talking for about six months and a lot of time after that. And uh, <laughs> a very interesting storyteller, exceptionally smart, sharp, uh, and could see, you know, and I wasn't surprised. I hadn't, I hadn't known that about Bonchar Manor, but I'm not surprised that he would have been helpful in, in looking far enough down the road to recognize the value of placing it side, you know, as close to the health, uh, all the health services that were congregating around the hospital. You know, that's the kind of vision that uh, he was known for us, so. Deep uh, he very well might have been warden at the time uh, when that all happened. I'm not sure 100%, but, uh, but yes. Any other comments from council members? Okay, hearing none. Uh, we're probably about 15, 20 minutes away from being totally finished. Uh, does anybody want to stop for a break for a couple of minutes? Uh, we are going to have to go into closed session. I don't see anybody putting up their hand to. Councillor Jamison, you want a break? Yeah. You're on, you're on mute, so I. Yeah, but I'm shaking my head. <laughs> 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 well, I was gathering you wanted to go, yes. A couple minutes. <laughs> so we'll, uh, I tell you what we'll do is we'll make the motion we'll window closed session and uh, we'll give Clerk Bomer then an opportunity to uh, uh, get us off uh, live streaming so that the Renfrew Town Council convene in closed session for the following matter pursuant to Section 239 Municipal Act 2001, pursuant to Section 239 2B of Municipal Act 2001, personal matters about an identical, identical individual, including municipal or a local school board employees. More specifically, it relates to an encroachment on the town owned property. Uh, mover, please. Councillor Jamison, seconded by Revimo. Uh, all in favor? Okay, we are now 